Green. The Indian government's education approach has been clumsy and unwieldy. Through the 1960s and 1970s, the focus of the governments in school education was on building infrastructure with little emphasis on teacher training, educational achievements and performance measurement. As a result, the total number of illiterates continues to grow, even as states haplessly built school after ineffective school, schools that were hollow promises with little teaching taking place within the buildings. Our education policies have funded schools, not schooling. This passage from Nanda Nilikani's Imagining India Ideas for a New Century captures the current crisis in our classrooms. Of an estimated 140 million children in the age group of 6 to 14 in primary schools, 50% cannot read simple words or solve simple arithmetic problems in the 5th grade. Only 58% can read a simple story and 42% can do a division problem. Shameful statistics for a country that aspires to be an intellectual capital. The biggest challenge continues to be the glaring disparity between privately run and government run schools. One of the major reasons for the dismal state of primary education is placing the control of schools in the hands of the middle government and state bureaucracy, leading to the lack of standardization. There is some reason for hope. In 2000, in his Independence Day speech, Adil Bihari Vajpayee spoke of full literacy by 2010. The NDA government met this problem with a well-funded, highly publicized effort, the Sarv Shiksha Abhyan, or the Mission for Universal Education. The UPA retained the scheme and ramped up funds through a 2% primary education CES implemented in 2004 and a 1% CES for secondary education implemented in 2007. But the solution to solving this crisis is not political attention and funding, but creating truly well-efficient, well-functioning schools. To discuss the ideas to address the challenges in our classroom, we're joined by Shobhna Bhartia, Chairperson and Editorial Director of HD Media, James Tooley, Professor of Education Policy at the University of Newcastle and the author of the landmark paper on trends in Indian schools, private schools for the poor. And Madhav Chavan, co-founder of Pratham, an NGO whose mission is to get every child in school and learning well. Of course, the author of Imagining India, Nanda Dedikari. Nanda, many thanks for joining us. Education is a fundamental right, but our track record has been dismal. The universal education goal has been deferred from 1959 to the 60s to the 70s, possibly not even going to be met in 2010. But how optimistic are you that for the first time we're actually seeing public expenditure uh, in schooling, but is that really going to solve the, the problem? Well, I think uh, there's definitely a lot of room for optimism because I think for the first time, the Indian state is really trying to address this issue. And as, as we talked about the fact that the SSA was started by the NDA government, but yeah, the UPA government consolidated that. There's a 3% says Now, that's a lot of money because our annual tax collection is about 500,000 crores. Mm. So we get 15,000 crores a year of cess money that goes only for primary and secondary education. So I think there's a huge push. If you look at the uh, 11th plan, mm. the 10th plan only had 7.7% of its uh, money for education. The 11th plan has 19%. Mm. So no, there's no doubt that education and the development of human capital mm. is, is now the central challenge. It's now but politically fashionable it's education. Absolutely. But the question is making it work on the ground. Madhu Chauhan, let me ask you, is it going to be working on the ground in the manner in which it was envisaged, given the fact that we've upped spending incredibly much more than we have ever in, in India, India's history? The way it was envisaged was to get all children in school. Yeah, and which is not going to happen out. by 2010. No, it's, it's working out. We do a survey, a household survey, and 93-95% kids, 93% uh, from six, eight, age 10 upwards, mm. and 95 plus percent from 6 to 10 age say we go to school. Uh, so that has happened. Uh, there is a school uh, within a kilometer of 98% habitations mm -hmm. uh, where there were insufficient classrooms in places like Bihar and UP. More classrooms have been built. Mm. Teachers are being appointed. So that quantitative part has, is, is being met. What to your, to your mind are the challenges really with the manner in which the SSA is being implemented? There are many issues because 
first priority for the government was to open schools, construct schools, recruit teachers in states that were lagging behind. The entire northern belt. Absolutely. Uh, from West Bengal to Rajasthan. So that's where the money was pumped in. Large amounts of money were pumped in. And the teachers were appointed. There's a whole issue of human capital, as Nanda was saying. Mm -hmm. Even teachers. Do we have good teachers? Because we have a very poor higher education system. Mm -hmm. Graduates coming out of that mm -hmm. are barely literate, mm -hmm. really. And so if they have to become teachers, then you have a case where half blinds are teaching other blinds. Mm -hmm. And then how to retrain these people to make classrooms mm -hmm. effective. That's the second part. And there is a system somewhere which is centralized, bureaucratic, which is not capable of reforming itself. But, you know, there's no point having a school if teachers don't come Absolutely. to work. And part of the reason is that the schools are not under the local government uh, leadership. They're not under panchayats. They're under some central admi state administration and therefore they're not accountable to the locals. So the problem of education is moving from enrollment mm. to quality. Mm. From, again, from, from getting people into schools to making sure they're well taught. And that's a huge change. Do you think we've seen a change as far as political support towards education is concerned? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, governments have realized that education does translate into votes. Many state governments, education is a state subject as we know. So there's been enough emphasis on it and the budgetary outlays have actually yeah. increased fourfolds over the last few years. So the bipartisan support that education receives, that Sarva Siksha Abhyan itself has mm. received is very apparent and it's evident. Then it gets into the realm of how each state actually uses yeah. it and yeah. it gets more into a qualitative issue mm. where certain states are actually doing a lot more than other yeah. states are doing. But just in terms of a genre, education is an area which is getting a lot of emphasis. Mm. Mother, just a quick point as far as you know, the different state experience is concerned because you've got MOUs with about, what, 14 state governments now. What's the experience been like for you at Pratham? No, our experience is that uh, states that have been backward so far, um, exception one or two states, are hungry to perform. Uh, I can state Bihar very clearly. Bihar is a huge drive and you can see that the chief minister downwards, people want to change. What happens is this, the states that are, shall we say, had achieved universal education in the last decade, mm. let's say the Kerala yeah. and the yeah. Maharashtra and the Tamil Nads, were sort of relaxed. Mm. And they were not, even Karnataka for that matter, was late to wake up on what needs to be done quality wise. Because they've reached a point beyond which the government is not thinking. That is all children in school. Give everybody midday meals, send mm. textbooks, so-called teacher trading. But what is the next level of quality that you can achieve? Nobody had thought about that. And